You ready for the Word? Words shape your future. Words shape your future. When I was at college, I had the privilege of studying 21st century American history and and one of my favourite presidents was a guy, you may not know of him, but his name was President Ronald Reagan. And in 1987, Ronald Reagan, the president, stood in Berlin at the Brandenburg Gates, at the Berlin Wall, where East met West, at the walls of Eastern Europe and communism that shut that down for so long. And he said these amazing speech in 1987, talking to the Soviet Union and President Gorbachev. He said these words, and you may remember them. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. I remember in the media, people thought that was a crazy thing to say. That's never gonna happen. That wall's been standing for nearly 60 years. And a series of events began to happen as those words were spoken. And two years later, in 1989, the wall, the Berlin Wall, the Communist Wall, the Iron Curtain came down. Words shape our future. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, the 32nd President of the United States, in 1933, in the middle of the Great Depression, when one in every three Americans was out of work, it was a tough time, the Great Depression. And he used a new technology called the radio. Don't you think that's funny, new technology called the radio? And he spoke on radio to the whole nation at one time. Listen to these words. He said this, First of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Fear is a tool of the devil to cripple your life. Fear steals your joy. Fear steals your destiny. Fear will imprison your hopes and dreams for your family. Fear will stop you stepping out in obedience to God. I wanna tell you today, fear does not come from the Lord. What does is, what is 2 Timothy 1.7 say? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. You see, fear restricts our lives, but God with faith expands our life. Fear restricts and faith expands. And I wanna encourage you as a Christian here today. I wanna encourage you as a member of Victory Church here in Tulsa, guess what? We're not building our lives on the sand. We're building our lives on the rock. Therefore, we will not fear because the storms in this world will come against our families. The storms and the winds will come against our church. But when your feet are on the rock, guess what? You're still standing when the storms come and gone, amen? So we need to realise that there is a greater season. I love this. These are the best days. Who believes that's a word from God this morning? I thank God for the old days, but I believe this is the best days. If you're over 60 today, raise your hand. Wow, your best days are ahead. Do you believe that? Thank God for all the faithfulness of the past years. You just need to read the last chapter of Job. Skip the first chapters, they're very depressing and discouraging. But the last chapter is where the double portion and the double blessing comes. Raise your hand if you're over 60. I speak a blessing. I speak favour, I speak joy unspeakable, I speak energy to run like Caleb at 80 years, taking my mountain for the Lord. And all the over six, he said, Amen. Amen. I love that, I feel the strength of the Lord. In Australia, we have a, a big nation. In fact, our nation is nearly as big as continental United States, but we only have a small population, 25 million people. I have a lot of friends. I grew up in a country town of 2,000 people and 10,000 cows. <laughs> in, our nation, in our nation, cattle ranches are very big. Like some ranches are bigger than the state of Connecticut. Some cattle ranches are bigger than the state of uh, Massachusetts. And I had a friend from South Carolina come and preach in Australia. And we took him out to the outback to see one of these farms. We went around this, this ranch and, and he said something to the farm. He said, I notice you have no fences here on this farm, this ranch. He said, you know why we don't have any fences? Because we have good wells. And the cattle never stray far from the wells. I believe in this season, we don't need fences around our church. We need to dig good wells. And when I came here this morning, I've been here all week and I've enjoyed the worship. We've been drinking from a well. And I wanna talk to you this morning about wells. If you could turn in your Bible to Genesis 26, verse one. And if you're looking for a title for this sermon this morning, it's called, It's Time to Dig. It's Time to Dig. 
Genesis 26 verse one says, there was a famine in the land. The first famine was in the days of Abraham and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gera. So there was a famine in Abraham's lifetime and now in Isaac, this was a long famine. This was a long drought. You know, last week I was in Northern California. They're going for a long drought. It affects the economy, it affects the farmers, it affects every part of community. This was a, a, a generational drought and famine. Now go to Genesis 26 verse 12. I'm gonna read a long piece of Scripture today, but I know this is a Bible-believing, Scripture-loving church, amen? Verse 12 says, Then Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Let's stop right there. Wow. Wow. One seed, hundredfold, that's a miracle. But you know what the other miracle is? This famine had been going so long, the ground was like concrete, it was like asphalt. And when everyone else had their John Deere tractors in the barn, God spoke to Isaac, get out your tractor, it's time to sow some seed. So sometimes we can be watching so much media and we're living our lives to the, to the, to the, to the worldly climate, but God's got a spiritual climate. And we're gonna hear what God's saying. And what's God's forecast for our lives? And Isaac wasn't listening. And so that's the great miracle. And this is when everyone else was not sowing, he was sowing. I'm telling some of the greatest time to sow in your life is when you're in a famine, when you're in a drought. Can I hear an amen? Verse 13, guess what happened? The Lord blessed him. It says, the man, that's Isaac, began to prosper. And he continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Who's liking the Scripture now? Turn to your name and say, very prosperous. Verse 14, he had possessions and flocks and possessions of herd and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And they'd filled them with earth. And when Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerah. And he dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they dug in the days of Abraham his father. There's a lot of digging. There's a lot of effort in this chapter. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. Then Isaac's servants dug in the valley. Notice first Isaac was digging. Then he's such an enthusiastic digger that suddenly everyone around him started digging as well. And they found a well of running water there. Verse 20, but the herdsmen of Gerah quarrelled with Isaac's herdsmen saying, this water is ours. So he called the well Esek because they quarrelled with him. Then they dug another well and they quarrelled over that one also. So he called the name Sitna. Then he moved from there and dug another well and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Then he went up there to Bathsheba and the Lord appeared to him that same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servants Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there and Isaac's servants dug another well. Let's go down now to verse 32 of chapter 26. It says this, And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug. And they said to him, We have found water. So we called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Bathsheba to this day. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank You for Your Word, the Holy Scriptures. We pray today this would not be the vain repetitions of a man, but Your Word would be like a supernatural seed planted in our hearts. I pray today that we'd walk out of these doors of this church, Lord, in, in faith, because we encountered Your presence in worship. We encountered Your Word preached in faith and we encountered the encouragement of fellow believers and all the people said... If we were to be honest, the last two and a half years have been a crazy season in the world. We've had COVID-19 pandemic. We've had high inflation, a war in the Ukraine, which has changed all of Europe, uncertainty with China, the cost of our daily living rising, concern over climate, culture wars. The language of this generation in 2022 is fear, fear, fear. Promoted and peddled in mainstream media and on social media. And like I said before, fear brings restriction, but faith brings expansion. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I don't know about you, but as a pastor, I get sick of all the prophets of doom 
And I've had enough of the peddlers of fear. And we as the church, as Christians, need to break out of a lockdown mentality and walk in a faith mentality. And one of the ways I believe we can do that is that we need to dig. It's time to get spiritually busy. It's time to contend. It's time to fight for God's promises over your own life, over your own family. It's time for the fight for the prophetic words spoken over a victory fellowship together. Wells speak of life. Wells speak of fruitfulness, blessing. Wells speak of growth. You know what? When you start a settlement in a new city, you'd either look for a stream or a brook or if there was nothing, you would dig a bore, dig a well because then you can build that around the city. So despite what's happening in the physical climate, you have resource below. And I wanna encourage you that it doesn't matter what's happening outside the climate of this church. When the well is deep and running, we can flourish in any environment. Can I have an amen? We're gonna redig some old wells that the enemy's filled in and also redig some new wells for a new season. The Philistines filled up those wells that his father had dug. But as soon as Isaac had a revelation, he went back to the old things, the things at first. I don't know about you, but through this pandemic season, there was things getting into my spirit. I was getting discouraged and I had delay and disappointment and frustration and discontent and distance. But you know what? I came to this point where I said, well, I'm just gonna dig out the old wells and tap in to the things of the Lord. It's time to redig the old wells in your life but it's also time to dig some new wills in your life. How do we redig the old wells? It's pretty simple. We did it this morning. Worship. How do we redig the old wells? We get down in prayer because prayer is an ultimate form of humility. Because when we pray, we say, God, we need you. How do we redig the old wells of our life? We come into the Word. We ask God for living water. I wanna ask you a question, has the devil blocked your flow and the wells of your life? Well, maybe it's time to redig and rename those things in your life to let the living water flow. To shake off the spiritual atrophy and redig those wells. But also we gotta redig new wells in this season of our lives personally. It's time for new things, new skills, new technologies, new people. What does the Bible say? New oil, new wine. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? It springs forth. We need to dig new wells for our children, our children's children. We need to dig new wells for our city and for our nation that needs God. And I believe today the Lord's gonna speak to you. He's gonna encourage you to say, come on, get back to that old thing you used to do, that first love that you had for me. But also it's time to redig some new wells. So if you're taking notes this morning, I've got four things that are gonna help you to redig the wells, to dig some wells. Number one is this. It's time to dig some wells so you can prosper in a famine. There was a famine in the land and Genesis 26, 12 said, Isaac sowed in the land in the middle of a famine, in the middle of a drought. He reaped in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper. He continued prospering till he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. I love this. He sowed a seed when no one else was sowing a seed. I wanna encourage you today, God's not worried about the world's economy or your unsaved family's opinion. Even if the world is depraved, the world we live in is evil, it is full of lies, it is full of false truths. I wanna encourage you today, you and I as Christians, we can still prosper. Our families can prosper and be healthy in an immoral and unhealthy world. In an ungodly education system, our families can flourish. Our kids can grow up with a passion for Jesus and a healthy self-esteem despite social media. The church we live in here in Tulsa, Victory, we're gonna prosper. Doesn't matter if it's a spiritual famine, an economic famine or a moral famine, the church will prosper, it's God's house. He will build His church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. In an economic famine, God's people can prosper. Your business can prosper despite the season. In a moral famine, God wants the church to prosper. Our marriages can prosper. Our families can be in health and prosper. Under a famine of ungodly leadership and government, the church will prosper. 
Under fascism in Nazi Germany, the church prospered. Under dictatorships, the church has prospered. Under slavery in Egypt, the children of Israel prospered and they multiplied. Under totalitarianism, under Caesar in Rome, the church of God in the book of Acts began to prosper. Under unjust kings, the church has prospered. Under persecution from other religions, the church will prosper and is prospering under persecution all over the world. Under capitalism, the church will prosper. Under democracy, the church will prosper. Under postmodernism, the church will prosper. Under pantheism, the church will prosper. Under a Republican government, the church will prosper. Under a Democrat government, even heaven forbid, if Bernie Sanders was president, the church is still going to prosper. In a famine, you can prosper. Why? Because God is God. God's not intimidated by man's opinions or laws. God's not bowing down to government or political thought. God's not being worried about cancelled, being cancelled on social media or groupthink. He is God. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. He is Emmanuel with us. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's Jesus Christ, the strong Son of God. I think you all need to stand to your feet and for 30 seconds, thank God. He's a victorious God. Give Him a shout of victory. Give Him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. We praise You, Jesus. We glorify Your Name. You are still on the throne. We worship and honour You. We glorify. Come on. Give Him a shout of victory this morning. Hallelujah. One more time. Give Him a shout. Hallelujah. Thank You, Jesus. You can take a seat. Doesn't matter what happens out the four walls of this church. God's people and God's house will prosper. Joseph prospered in the pit. Joseph prospered as a slave in part of his house. Joseph prospered in the prison. Joseph then prospered in the palace. Then Joseph prospered in government as the prime minister. Daniel was kidnapped, taken hostage from Israel to the wicked city of Babylon. And in the heart of wickedness, he prospered. He excelled at the studies of the Ur Chaldeans and he became a person of influence for the kingdom. In the book of Acts, the more the church was persecuted, the more it grew and the more it prospered. 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So stop listening to the prophets of doom and the peddlers of fear. Let's start getting into the Word which brings faith. You know, uh, we took on a church in the nation of Hong Kong in 2020. And I talked to a couple of my church pastors and my staff for 15 years. I said, I feel the Lord's telling me you should go to Hong Kong with your family, three children. Would you pray about it? They went and prayed and fasted. They came back and said, God's given us a Word. We're going to Hong Kong. Then other pastors ringing him saying, hey, We heard you move into Hong Kong. Why would you go there? It's dangerous. It's unstable. It's uncertain. What about your kids? He goes, why would I not go there? They said, why are you going there? Because he said, God told me to. The safest place to be is in the will of God. And so they took their family in 2020, their three kids, and they've gone to Hong Kong and they're preaching hope and they're preaching God. And guess what? The kingdom of God, the church of God is prospering. Don't look at the... Don't look at the signs of this world. Come to the signs of the Lord. Gira means lodging place. I wanna encourage you, church, we can all prosper. doesn't matter what the climate is of our nation. Maybe you believe in to purchase your first home. You think it's impossible. You can prosper. Start a new business. You can prosper. Get a better job. It's time to prosper. Second thing is this. If you, it's time to dig some wells, you will have to fight and contend for your blessing. In Genesis 26 here, Isaac keeps digging well. God keeps blessing him and other people fight and argue for what he's dug. And at first he fights back and then I think he comes to the point going, well, God's given me a gift to find water and God's a God of never ending resource. Well, you can have this. Well, I'll just go and dig some more. And he keeps digging and then people keep fighting over his well. And I wanna encourage you, sometimes God gives it. Who loves it when God speaks to you and gives you a word or gives you a promise? I love that. But then walking it through and fighting it through, that's another matter. There's sometimes as Christians, we're gonna fight and contend for our blessings. Sometimes you gotta fight for that promise that God gave you in the Word. You get a Word from God and everything happens opposite to what you got prophesied. (laughs) Sometimes you gotta go to war for your family. Sometimes you have to dig old wells and new wells for the church to go forward. 
When God blesses you, sometimes the people around you can't handle the blessing and they don't rejoice in your blessing. The well of Esek means argument. The well of Sitna means hostility. There will be opposition to your marriage in God your family. There will be opposition to the leadership call on your life. There'll be opposition from unsaved family when you get saved. Opposition to your faith at university or in your place of employment. Opposition and persecution for your stand for Christ in the workplace. Opposition to your business because you represent the Kingdom of God. Opposition to your dreams and visions that God has given you. There will be opposition to this church victory because we stand for Jesus crucified and Jesus resurrected from the grave. But Ephesians 6 says we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rules of this dark age. And we've read the last chapter of Revelation. We win. So do not, even Jesus said to the disciples, do not be surprised when you're persecuted for my name's sake. I want to encourage you that there is a culture war going. There is a battle for our mind going on. There's a lustful spirit, a materialistic thinking, a selfish thinking, a fleshly thinking, an elitist thinking, a victim thinking. I could go on and on, but we've got to contend with that thought every day. We've got to renew our minds. We've got to wrestle those thoughts to the ground and submit them to Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to be proved what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You wanna know what the will of God is? Renew your heart and mind. I want to encourage people today. Many Christians in my church, they've got faith to believe for other people. When someone gets sick, they'll pray for them. They'll believe for financial breakthrough. But many, many times we're happy. We've got faith to believe for others, but sometimes we don't have faith to believe for ourselves. I feel the Holy Spirit wants to say to you this morning, be selfish. Keep believing for others and blessing others. But maybe you've got to write some things down as a married couple. And so we're going to believe for this for our family, a breakthrough in our health. A salvation of backslidden children, believing for financial faith, whatever it may be. And let's be a little bit selfish. I love Jabez. In 1 Chronicles 4.10, 1 Chronicles 4.10, Jabez prays an audacious, outrageous prayer. He says, Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, that you would keep me from evil and that I may not cause pain. And I love this last verse. So God granted him what he requested. Maybe you just haven't been praying big enough prayers. Don't pray, don't pray prayers that you can achieve in your own strength. Pray outrageous prayers, dangerous prayers, prayers that you need to partner with God in to see Him fulfilled. Today, if you have kids away from the Lord, we're gonna believe for them to come back to God. They don't belong to the kingdom of this world, they belong to the kingdom of God. The prodigal sons, the prodigal daughter. I prayed, I prayed. You know, I feel these people, you're weary for praying, but the, the Spirit of God's gonna give you a surge of faith to keep on believing because God loves your children more than you do. And He wants them to see them in the house of God. So stir up your faith. Pray those prayers for salvation. You know, in 2011 in my city, we had a big flood. 65,000 houses and businesses were flooded. Our church, main campus was flooded. We had a seven foot river going through our church. And uh, I put the insurance claim in for 1.4 million Australian dollars. That's about 50 American dollars. No, it's a little bit more than that. (laughs) The insurance company came back to me and said, we're gonna give you $250,000. 1.4, 250,000. Well, we were freaking out. We're gonna go bankrupt as a church. That year alone, we had, I think, 18 different venues over 18 months. We were spiritual refugees in our own city. People started leaving the church because we didn't have a home. Our finances went backward. I was stressing each each night. I'm praying. I'm going to have to lay off half the staff. And I was just trying in my own strength to solve this problem. We took the insurance company to court. And then the longer it went, our our building was sitting derelict, empty because we couldn't even renovate it because there was a court action going on. And it was the most pressured time in my life. And finally, after 18 months and no solution, I got down on my knees one night. I said, God, I can't sleep. I don't know what to do. And God said, finally, Finally, you're asking me to help you. It's funny, isn't it? His grace is sufficient for us. His strength is made perfect in our strength. No, His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Lord, I don't know what to do. Some of the greatest prayers aren't that theological. Some of the greatest prayers aren't that eloquent. They go like this, help! (laughs) Help me, Lord. The next night I went to a Bill Johnson meeting. I'm telling you, you've got to sign up now for January for Victory Conference. 
Because Bill Johnson, man, I'm telling you, he's a revelation bomb just coming off that platform. And in that meeting, the Holy Spirit healed something in my heart. And God spoke to me, this is how you're going to see a breakthrough to this 18-month court action. You're going to tithe the amount of insurance you're believing for. The next day I went to our board meeting. I said to the pastors, how much, I said to the board members, how much do we need to survive? They said, if we had a million, we'd be okay, Paul. I said, God's given me the keys for breakthrough. They said, Let, tell us. I said, we're going to tithe on what we're believing for. You should have seen their jaws hit the floor. <laughs> I said to our treasurer, how much money we got? He said, we got 120,000 in the bank. I said, good, we got 100,000 to tithe. And so we got 10 checks out. We wrote a check to missions organisations and we just stepped out in faith, believe in God. And then three days later, I get a phone call. Is this Pastor Paul Geeling? Yes. I'm your new insurance assessor. I don't understand why this case has gone for 18 months. This has costed me money. It's costing you money. I'd like to solve it today. Could you, would you be okay to settle on a million dollars? I said, let me pray about that. Yes. Come on. Contend for your blessing. Pray for your promise. Let's believe God. Amen. Third thing is this. It's time to dig some wells. Just because you are in a good place, does not mean you're in ultimate, God's ultimate place. Genesis 26, 22 says, and he moved from there and he dug another well and they did not quarrel over it. So we called the name Rehoboth because the Lord said, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Rehoth means open space. Rehoth means good place, a time of rest. Do you remember when you purchased your first house? Maybe it wasn't your dream home, but you're just thankful to have a house. Do you remember when you got your first job? It's probably not your dream job, but you're glad you got that first job. Sometimes God will give you seasons of space, seasons of rest, seasons of recovery, but don't get comfortable because where you may be right now may be a good place, but it's not God's ultimate place for you. It's not God's ultimate destination. Enjoy it, be blessed, prosper, but remember God orders your steps. Don't get so comfortable in your place right now that God cannot challenge you to dig a new well for your family, for your life. My wife and I, we've been married 27 years. It's a good thing. And uh, when we were youth pastors, we've been youth pastors 10 years. We're in a mega church in the city of Adelaide. We loved our church. We loved our team. We're really comfortable. God was blessing us on the left and the right. And then one day I got a phone call from my senior pastor saying, I've been asked by another senior pastor, would you and Joe go to 2,000 miles away to another city to plant a church? I'm like, no. I like it here. I know everybody here. I'm blessed here. My wife's family's all here. And you know what? God just kept stirring us and stirring us till finally I surrendered. I said, Lord, I'm willing to do anything for you. And I went and dug another well which is the city that I'm in right now. Yes, you may be in a good place, but let's not get too comfortable that God says to us, it's time to dig another well. And lastly, number four, it's time to dig some wells. You will eventually make it to your well of promise. You know, through the scripture in Genesis 26, there's just a lot of effort. There's a lot of digging. If you've got some gray hairs or some lack of hair like myself, You've been through some seasons and you've dug a lot of things in the Lord. You've been through the good seasons and the challenging seasons. Genesis 26, 32 says this. It says, it came to pass that same day that Isaac's servants came to him and told them about a well which they had dug. And they said to him, we have found water. So we called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Besheba to this day. Besheba means well of oath. Besheba means well of promise. Besheba means well of legacy. You know you can go to Besheba right now. I've been to that city. And you can drink from the same well that Isaac dug thousands of years ago. That well, thousands of years later, is still giving life to that city. I believe Victory Church, we haven't, we haven't struck the Besheba well yet. I'm thankful for all the wells of the past. You know, there was a sign up there established in 1991. Pastor Billy Joe and Pastor Sharon planted this church, started digging a well in faith. We gotta redig that old well, get back to some of those things at the beginning. But I'm telling you, Pastor Paul, he's digging wells right now for this church and you're digging with him. But I tell you, Pastor Paul, we haven't struck Beersheba yet. 
a well of legacy that would bring life to the whole city of Tulsa, state of Oklahoma, flood to other states around us in this nation. And you know what? Doesn't matter where you are in your Christian walk, what age you are. We thank God we're going to redig the old wells. But what new wells are you going to dig for your family? A well that's going to go beyond your lifetime. You think about it. Thousands of years later, you can still drink pure, fresh water, life-giving water from the wells of Bathsheba. I'm so thankful my parents, when I was five, gave their lives to Christ, dug a well for a new generation. What are we going to dig? What are we going to do here at Victory that other generations will celebrate us for? A well of legacy. I want to get to the place of promise, the place of the seven wells, the abundance, the overflow. So let's keep contending. Let's keep believing for the promises of God. Let's keep fighting. Let's keep digging in the Spirit, in prayer, in worship, in Word. Keep contending for those promises over your family. But you know what? That over this church victory, there's unfulfilled prophetic words have yet to be finished, yet to be fulfilled. We haven't yet struck Bathsheba. I finished with this. Like I said before, we've been married 27 years. When we got married, our pastor was marrying us. It was a wonderful day. And at the end of the marriage ceremony, our pastor said, hey, my wife's uncle is a well-known prophet. And now she said, Pastor Steve, would you come and pray and prophesy over this young couple? So we pr- he prayed and he started prophesying at our wedding about what we would do for the kingdom and missions and church planning and all things. And then it's about 1995. The last paragraph of his prophecy, I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, I see you having a voice at the Olympics. Now look at this body. This is not an athlete's body, okay? Come on. 1995. But right then at that time, we'd just been awarded the Olympics in Sydney for the year 2000. So I, I'm not, I don't know what that was. So we go on a honeymoon. I come back, my senior pastor calls me into his office and says, are you moving to Sydney? I said, no, I don't like Sydney. I'm not going to Sydney. He said, good, because I don't know what that prophetic word meant. Just put it on the shelf. Well, during the pandemic in 2020, we had severe lockdowns in Australia. Our governor would come on television every day. And I can be honest, as a pastor and a Christian, I was not displaying the fruits of the Spirit. And she's saying this stuff and I'm like, Lord, help me get the right spirit in me, renew me. And then one day in the middle of the pandemic, she makes this announcement about COVID. Then she says, and you know what? I've got some good news. We've just been awarded Brisbane, Australia, the Summer Olympics of 2032. And I'm like, whoa, that prophetic word, 27 years ago, came alive in my spirit. I thought, wow, I thought I was gonna have a missions church to the nations. All the nations are coming to my city in 2032. So I'm digging right now. I'm contending. I'm preparing some new wells so we would have a move of God. When the nations come to our city, there's gonna be a move of God in our city and Christ is gonna come and transform lives and people are gonna go back to their nations. See, sometimes sometimes we haven't hit the well of legacy, the well of Bathsheba yet. Can you all stand your feet all over this place? Sorry, I've gone over here tonight, church. This morning, sorry. I don't know what time zone I'm on. In Australia, it's 1 a.m. in the morning right now. So please forgive me for everything I've said. (laughs) Could you close your eyes? I feel firstly to speak to people here today. And if you're to be honest, you've been living your life on words and thoughts of fear, not words and thoughts of faith. And I'm telling you, that's the devil's plan to paralyse you. But the Word of God brings faith. Say, Pastor Paul, I don't want to dictate my future by living in fear. I want to live by faith in God. The Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. We're not immune from the challenges of this world. The difference is God is with us. He's with us. Emmanuel, not God of fire. Emmanuel, God with us. So you say this morning, Pastor Paul, I just realised I've got to get into the faith zone, out of the fear zone. If that's you, lift your hands towards the Lord right now, all over this place. Thank you, church. Thank you, church. Holy Spirit, I rebuke fear in the Name of Jesus. Even Jesus, when the devil tempted him, said, it is written, He used the Word of God. I pray I come against the spirit of fear and I speak power, love and sound judgment, wisdom in the Name of Jesus. 
Lord. Let faith arise within Him to believe Your Word. And even like in the, in the, in the Gospels that said, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. I pray today, Holy Spirit, draw out the promises of God. Let them speak a language of faith, of not fear. Let them shape the future with their words of faith. Let them prophesy in their own world to their future, saying, this is the Word of the Lord. It is written. And Lord, I pray today, let fear be gone in the Name of Jesus. And let faith be released, we pray in Jesus' Name. And I, I feel to declare this this morning. It doesn't matter what happens in the world. It doesn't matter what happens who's in power in government. The church will prosper in a famine because it's God's house. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. This is God's house. God's house. God's house. It's such a privilege to walk through the doors of this church on a Sunday. Thank You, Lord, for the opportunity. And I declare that this church would prosper in the famine in a spiritual famine, in an economic famine, in a moral famine, this church is gonna be a well of living water. Strong marriages, strong families, strong faith. This is gonna be a place of miracles, a house of salvation. We thank You for this in the mighty Name of Jesus. And now we're gonna pray for legacy. I thank God. Some of you gotta go home and dig some old wells, but some of you, it's time to, to get off Start digging in prayer and in the Spirit. I'm looking forward to coming back here in a couple of years' time and seeing what God's doing in victory in your life. What we do now sets the culture, what the precedence we do now sets the culture for tomorrow. If we would sow in prayer now, imagine what tomorrow could be. Not just Pastor Paul praying by himself, but if we all join with Pastor Paul in prayer, man, we can shake a city. And this city needs to be shaken. This nation needs to be shaken. So maybe today, I want you to contend for those promises and believe God. I wanna pray for one thing and then we're gonna pray for our church. I'm gonna hand back to Pastor Paul. But right now, if you have children away from the Lord, we're gonna pray together. We're gonna believe for a season the prodigals are coming home. The backsliders are coming. If you have kids away from the Lord, a spouse away from the Lord, grandkids away from the Lord, right now, we're gonna contend. Some of you have been praying for a long time and you've given up, but I'm telling you, God's stirring to believe, 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 believe. Raise your hands all over this place. I'm not gonna be the only one praying. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray for our families. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord, amen. We're gonna declare it. We don't see it in the natural, but we're believing in the future. We're prophesying it over our family. Come on, let's all pray together. If you don't wanna pray in English, why don't you pray in the Spirit? Rabbi, we call upon our sons and daughters, upon our grandchildren, upon our unsaved spouses. And we say they don't belong to the kingdom of this world. They belong to the kingdom of our God. And we call them home in the Name of Jesus. We call them home in the name. They belong to You, Lord. Devil, we cast the blindness be taken off their eyes. Let them be revealed to the love of Christ, to the love of the Father. And we pray, let there be salvation in each household. Let the prodigal sons and prodigal turtles return. Let us be in church looking down the road, seeing our sons and daughters and our grandchildren worshipping together. And we will say to God, be the glory, great things He's done. Come on, let's give Him a shout of victory and believe right now in the Name of Jesus. Jesus, in the Name of Jesus, salvation, 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 salvation. Now I want you to grab the hand of the person next to you because we're all part of one family called Victory Church. I said this in the last service. Victory is a prophetic statement. This is not victim church. This is not downtrodden church. This is not poverty church. This is not faithless church. This is victory in Jesus, church. Resurrected, crucified, risen Lord. That's the church. So we're gonna pray for our church. We're gonna pray for Pastor Paul and the leadership. We're gonna redig the old wells that started this place, but we're believing for Bathsheba, 
the well of legacy, the well of transformation. So I don't wanna be the only one praying. Would you pray with me together, church? Come on, let's pray right now. We thank You for this house. Whether we've been here one year or 40 years, it doesn't matter, Lord. This is Your house. And we pray, oh God, as sons and daughters, we're gonna pick up a shovel and start digging in the things of the Spirit, digging in the Word, digging in the house of God. Lord, we thank You for this church. Lord, we pray every prophetic word that's yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled. We pray for Pastor Paul and Pastor Ashley and the leadership team. Strengthen them as they lead this house, oh God. We're gonna have victory on the left, victory on the right, victory forward, victory behind, victory in the name of Jesus Christ. So let the people of God give out an almighty shout this morning of victory. Victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. Come on, give Him a shout of praise. A shout of victory. The church will prosper. We will prosper in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll just pray before I go. Head back to us. Could you close your eyes and bow your head? Maybe today you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. Well, this is your opportunity to surrender your heart to Him. God loves you so much. Not only did He die on the cross just for you, He sent a bald pastor from Australia to preach, to pray this prayer with you this morning. You say, how to become a Christian? You just pray a prayer. What's prayer? Having a conversation with God. The book of Romans says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and He was risen from the dead, you shall be saved. It's called being born again. Or maybe today you're a prodigal son and a prodigal daughter. God loves you. He doesn't reject you. The Father's arms are open wide. Say, come home, son. Come home, daughter. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, whether you're in the room or online this morning, you say, Pastor Paul, would you pray with me? I wanna give my life to Christ. It would be my greatest honour and privilege here at Victory today to pray this prayer with you. You say, Paul, would you pray with me? I wanna give my life to Christ. I wanna get my life right with God. On the count of three, I want you to do something bold so I know who I'm praying with. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand all over this place and we're gonna pray a prayer together. One, two, three. Just raise your hand wherever you may be. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Up on the balcony. Thank you. So many people raising your hands. The Bible says when one person wants to pray this prayer, all of heaven rejoices. So we're excited about you praying this prayer this morning. Church, I don't want them to be alone this morning. So we're all going to pray this prayer together. And forgive me for my accent. I was saying heart. People were saying heart. You get a different accent than mine. Hey, every tribe, every nation is going to be in heaven, even Australians. So come on, let's pray this prayer together today. Dear Jesus, come on, say it with passion. Dear Jesus, I come to You today and I ask You to be my Lord, to be my Saviour, to be my friend. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Take away my shame. Give me a new heart and a new start. I wanna follow You all of my days. 